Moving on to our next panel. Um, earlier, we had a session on entrepreneurship for gender equality, and it touched on so many aspects of our everyday life that need improving. Social justice, eradicating poverty, education, getting women back in the workforce, pay equality, it just goes on and on. It's heartening to see products and services catering to girls and women becoming fertile ground for investment after being you know, so underserved for so long. And that, in fact, is just an example of impact investing in companies that balances measurable returns, both from a financial, social, and environmental aspect. And we're very privileged this afternoon to listen in on a conversation between two experts on impact investing with a focus on the European Union. I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Mali Mbong, CEO and co-founder of W Lounge. Hi, Mali. Hello, hello. Hey, where are you uh, dialing in from? Uh, I'm from Berlin. Oh, okay, fantastic. Um, Mali is the co-founder of Women's Influencers, a uh, women organization with the mission of bringing more women to the front of businesses locally and internationally. W Lounge is one of the biggest and most influential tech networks in Germany. And she can also talk to you about Magda Group, a new venture fund in Berlin. Um, joining Mali is Florian Kemmerich. Florian, hello. Hi there, pleasure to be here, thank you. Uh, great. Are you in? Are you in Germany as well? No, I'm based in Geneva, Switzerland. Oh, you're in Geneva. Fantastic, Florian. Uh, your background is actually in life sciences and biotech. Correct. Yeah. That was my previous life some years previous back. Life. Yes. <laughs> and but again, Florian... absolutely, I have a long history in healthcare, life science, biotech originally, but much more on the transaction side, business development side. And that has led me into the private equity and from therefore into impact investing today. That's fantastic. Um, you're now part of Bamboo Capital Partners and you guys invest in four sectors, financial inclusion, access to clean energy, access to healthcare and agribusiness. I was just actually looking at your website the past couple of days and you've invested in a couple of really in uh, interesting and impressive companies, Greenlight Planet, which provides affordable energy and solar powered products and services in Africa, serving 2 billion people. Vision Banco, a growing financial institution for micro and small medium enterprise in Paraguay, it goes on. That's right. correct, yes. All right. Again, I was, just to explain our sweet spot is we back entrepreneurs, we invest in SMEs basically, or MSMEs, even the smaller ones, providing essential services to the um, rural population and emerging markets. And that's where you can see simply access to money, yes. to healthcare, to energy, education, and agribusiness. Okay, fantastic. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to Mali and Florian. Thank you very Thank you much. So Thank you so much. Uh, hello, Florian, how are you? Fine, great pleasure. And thank you for um, inviting me, Mali. Always. Um, it feels like home hearing you here on the panel. Um, I really want us, let's say, to have some kind of like a coffee call because, you know, we have so much to share. And today, our most of the audience is from Asia. And we are here in Germany. I'm in Germany. Uh, you are in uh, um, Switzerland. And um, I would say, let's call it Dach area for a second, because eventually it's kind of like very similar, very common culture. And um, today, I think our discussion will be able to send another message out of Europe. And the message that we want to send out of Europe, it's, it was definitely pre-COVID-19, but absolutely became much more mainstream or stronger after COVID-19. And we call it impact investment. When I thought about, you know, building a W Lounge, which, you know, I moved to Berlin from Tel Aviv six years ago, saw that there's nothing here to promote entrepreneurship and highlight women in tech and women absolutely investor. Um, that was one of the, I would say, initiative that immediately I brought to the market, of course, not alone, with partners, with great people that supporting us with this mission and definitely building a fund of fund. And I want to also give you this stage to share more about the SDG 500. 
because when we met, you mentioned SD2500 as a huge project that I'm, I'm very proud to support or even be part of it. But mm. this is a message that today coming out of Europe. Yeah, maybe just to explain things. So um, just going back, you know, the, inter the, in <clears throat> the focus of impact investing is to basically use capital as a force for good. So you invest and for financial returns, at the same time, you want to resolve one of the biggest you know, challenges of the world, for example, climate change, poverty uplift, economic inclusion. So those are the things where you want to trigger change through the investment. That in the past was difficult um, because the you know, the geography specifically where we were investing is in, in emerging markets are very risky. And again, risk and return go alongside with an investor. So an investor would expect to invest if the higher the risk, the higher the return. Typical venture approaches, for example, or angel investors come very early, very risky, but want to have the, the upside of it. And then you have, you know, late stage investors, growth investors, uh, and so on. So this in the scenario is now, it's an exciting time where you have basically, and by the way, in the same geography traditionally, you would have aid money also, you know, to help the poor people by providing philanthropic and aid money. And all of that is converging now in a very interesting part where you have the aid money, understanding that they can double down if they do impact investing rather than just a one-off. It's not just a donation and then it's gone. Also understanding that if I invest like I invest everywhere, I can create structure. The second set thing is you have, as the wealth is moving from the baby boomers to the millennials, the quest for purpose. I know I'm investing, but is my investment harming the world or helping the world? And then of course, specifically the angle of technology, because technology is cheap and available everywhere in the world now. So you have these tsunamis. Now, if you look at that, in the past, you have the old silos. You have the for-profit investors, and the non-for-profit arm philanthropy. And very often is I make money first and then I give money back. And then you have also the, the understanding that usually you had, in order to do business, to go to the cities and go to the rich countries if you are, come up from a, come from a, from a uh, developing country. All of that is being changed and shifted as we are in the fourth industrial revolution. And that is really the culmination of what you, you, know, what you just mentioned, the SDG 500 because we're investing in SDGs in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So clearly resolving issues on the ground, you know, helping smallholder farmers, uh, supporting gender justice, a big theme, you know, alongside again, women and also children is a big, is a big theme in, in, in impact investing. And then you have parts of course, tech for impact because technology resolves at least for our investment access and affordability of goods and services for the low income population. So they can now participate. So if a home has electricity and hopefully clean electricity, if a home has internet access, and if a home has financial you know, financing mechanisms, they can participate in the real world. And we had that just in the previous panel actually discussing that COVID accelerates that and changes that. That we understand that we don't have to hop on a plane, see each other, and do business. So therefore, I don't have to sit in New York or in Silicon Valley or in Berlin or in Geneva to do business. I can do that wherever I am. And that has a, a clear benefit of understanding now, as we are in the fourth industrial revolution and we are in the inclusive area now, not the exclusive. I have my product, my competitor, my brand and my silo. This is gone. I need to be open, flexible, adjusting to change constantly and taking advantage of that by being inclusive. And this is really the endeavor with SDG 500 where you have non-for-profit money protecting for-profit investors on a risky investment we're doing. And that means the company we're investing in doesn't have to be only in a emerging market. They can sit anywhere because tech for impact, you know, it doesn't matter where the company is incorporated. I mean, um, just uh, previously, um, uh, Roma mentioned that uh, we invested, for example, Greenlight Planet. Greenlight Planet is incorporated in the US, but they operate. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. At the end, the beneficiary is where the 
where the, where the wealth is created, where the transaction happens. And that's the beauty of doing a, let's say, a public-private partnership in a very specific way to invest small tickets, private debt and private equity, to back entrepreneurs around the world, specifically in Asia also, and of course, through our Singapore office. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Florian. And, you know, I think two years ago, I was on, on stage. It's uh, one of the biggest, uh, I would say, venture capital in Israel. Um, it was in um, Venice, and we talked about impact investment. And I, I have to tell you that the audience was really mixed, and many people ask questions about, like, why we need to talk about that, you know? It looks like NGO. It looks like non-profit. And we always needed to send a message that impact investment is also for revenue. It's leading me to my next question and asking you, who are the kind of investors, governments or associations that usually backing you or kind of uh, impact investors? Um, so they're actually into Traditionally, it would have been only specific either family offices saying, I want to trigger change. Or it would have been, uh, let's say, governments with their development finance institutions. Or it would have been a um, specific approach of, um, let's say, endeavors by foundations. That's the origins ones. But all of that is changing. Today, you have, you know, green bonds, now you can argue whether that's impact investing, probably it's more ESG, which is fine. Yeah, but again, you have, you know, impact investing covers all asset classes from, you know, stock, stock trading down to very specific funding of the, you know, of the, of the marginated population, you know, in the geographies where we are, so the big spread. And that is also because of the understanding that doing good doesn't mean less returns financially. It can actually be the opposite. So sustainability is a product and you can sell the product. So you can do real estate and you can do sustainable real estate and you charge a higher price. You can do food and agriculture or you can do organic food, you know, and bio uh, approaches and you charge differently. You see that in the coffee very often that, uh, you know, coffee farmers have moved in uh, towards the, uh, the organic way of doing it even though the yield is lower, but the price is higher. So you can see there are certain things where you can actually do, you know, invest very smartly, but it, it is more the younger generation pushing this because the, you know, other people would have the psychological mindset saying either you do good or you make money, you cannot do both. And again, the quest today is, yes, I want to make money and I want to do good. So this you is the trend. Yes, so therefore today you have all type of investors coming into impact investing on a different risk reward uh, scenario and different asset classes. But it's becoming, if you just from a size, I mean, as of 2019, we were over half a trillion in impact investing. I'm not saying sustainability, ESG, there's much more money. But really impact investing is half a trillion doubled in two years. And we see that trend going. So impact investing is probably becoming the new norm, especially post COVID, which is a great trend. Which brought us to be suddenly a mainstream, you know, we are not the weirdos anymore. Yes. <laughs> but, but I want to, I, I mean, you mentioned something very interesting, like the, I would say the capital is shifting, which I love it because like, let's say we are the next generation of the investors, even like younger than us, uh, the 30 something. So, I would say, yes, I see that this upcoming uh, investor generation are absolutely focusing on doing good with their money. And uh, what I want to ask you is, you know, I'm also raising Magda Group and Magda Group is actually coming from a power position using the network for good, opening those venture capitals, boys clubs, but also give them much more capital to grow faster because let's stick to the facts it's very hard to count unicorns really huge unicorns like google facebook and so that coming out of europe 
And we are European, although we are working in emerging markets and we are, I would say, willing and, and, and planning to do good in other continents, important ones. But eventually, I see it as a message that's coming from Europe. Tell me what do you think about this? So you are, let's say the message is correct. If you go back to the origins, Europe has been driving impact investing, what is today called impact investing for many, many years. Actually my partner and the founder of Bamboo, you know, he, before Bamboo, he created another firm, which is now belongs to a big, big group. Um, and that's over 20 years ago. So yes, indeed, and you had a lot, the Nordics, Benelux, Switzerland, really driving those, the quest, you know, to do impact investing, trying to do it at the, at the early stage. So it's for sure something. And now, of course, this is big, big embrace in the US, for example, and all over the world, the understanding. Now, there also lie some dangers, because as we are within the fourth industrial revolution, not only in a phase where we are overloaded with information and now everything is virtual as our conversation here. But also at the same time, storytelling has become more important than the facts or the data itself. So there, as you can see, there's a lot of criticism going on in impact investing for so-called impact washing or green washing, you know, or social washing of people saying, yeah, I do good. Yeah. Just by telling a story, but it actually might not be really because you might still harm the planet. And then you, even if you look at the SDGs, you have 17 SDGs. If you invest in one SDG, you might not help the other SDG yeah, because there might be a, a trade-off. Again, it's not that easy and straightforward. So therefore the data you gather and what is happening on the ground is crucial. And you know, you shouldn't be lost in an academic way, but also this means that if you are, Two things, if you are running a business, you might not think about impact investing, but if you look at how you reposition your core values of your company from away from shareholder value to stakeholder value, you might actually be able to qualify for impact investing capital or at least sustainable you know, ESG capital for you to join your company and to fund your company, which is more than just bringing money to the table for you to do your job. There's a caveat to it, but it's probably a very positive caveat for the overall value of the company going forward. That's on one side. The second thing is, if you um, look at your business and you try to see what are the issues you can solve by doing whatever you do, you know, in whatever sector you are in there, from a holistic perspective, again, shareholder, Stakeholder, stakeholder means, you know, your community. Stakeholder means planet, you know, the waste management or whatever is behind. Stakeholder might mean your providers. Stakeholder might also mean your investors. So, so those are the things where you create actually an intrinsic motivation of your team because people are proud of being part of something. And that gives them <clears throat> a very different stimulus than just a higher pay you know, a higher pay, you know, a financial stimulus, but really to drive, drive the value. And you see that a lot in impact investing also, you know, from the impact investor that the purpose, the quest for purpose is bigger than actually the financial, which shouldn't be a trade-off, but again, it's a great, great way to start. So we screen from the first, we have a, we have a, you know, a, a set frame where we screen an opportunity to invest on the impact first, and then we look at the feasibility on the financial side, whether it makes sense for us to, to invest or not. So let's say that we both a serial entrepreneur. I mean, I think this is the best way to become a good investor. You know, you've been there, done that. Uh, you know how to help your hopefully portfolio very well, uh, or I would say make their journey easier or faster. And I want to ask you, um, as entrepreneur, again, shifting to Europe, we are talking today, definitely also in the EIC, you know, I'm jury in the European Commission uh, Innovation Council, and there is massive discussion if those startups are doing good, if those startups will show a good revenue at the same time. So how is an investor and serial entrepreneur, you, what tip you can give to 
worldwide entrepreneurs that right now listening to us, founders um, in, in startups, how they can become they can become an impact product because my belief and things that I see, yes, it's coming back to the storytelling you mentioned. Almost every company from big corporates to a small startup, they can adopt the impact mindset. What do you think about that? <laughs> I agree, but every decision in every decision, you know, you do something and you don't do something else. It's a decision and you, you have to decide whether you have two paths, you know, what is the higher reward? And you have to ask yourself, what is the reward you're looking for? It doesn't mean that you are, this is, here's the money and there's doing good. Again, it's not, but it's in a very smart way to look at because yes, you might do certain products you produce, you might stop doing it because you know they harm the planet or you might gradually improve your product in order to be less harmful to the planet or people. But because they're important, I mean, we can discuss plastic. You know, banning plastic doesn't help. You know, plastic is part of our life. We need to make sure that the planet, you know, the plastic is not ending up in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So therefore it's a circular economy issue. So then therefore you might still produce plastic, but you might think about how to stimulate that the plastic is coming back or the one time single use plastic is cheaper. So if the buyer or the consumer is not aware and wants to have a cheaper product, doesn't want to pay, pay extra for maybe a resorbable plastic or recyclable plastic. That's just one example. Those are the things when you are in your sector and in your specific area, you know, your geography, but also what you produce and what you're offering has to be thought from a holistic point of view. And then to see what is the value add you can provide, but you need to communicate it so that the, your buyer of your product is okay, you know, with your approach, which not always means you have to hire, have to, let's say, have a higher cost, but it might actually be an improved perceived value so that you can charge higher and you have a better margin situation or you can go for larger volumes. So that, that's the mindset where it is really starting from the core values. You know, what do you stand for? And what, where do you think you can use your business to resolve an issue of the world at the same time, increasing your perceived value of what the company does. And therefore you as the enterprise value is higher for you and the business you are in. I have to give you an example. You know, I was working with Chinese factories in Dongguan area and Shenzhen for eight years. So I know exactly what you're talking about. When I came to Germany, you know, they took me to see some factories around and then I saw phenomenal magic, like how one factory is actually fitted another one, you know, the leftovers, it's actually the, the, the raw material, the other one needs to buy. So I totally agree with you. It's a lot of things to, to work and absolutely, you know, we're talking today on Hong Kong uh, um, Impact Summit. So that's a fantastic topic because we're talking about startup, but eventually there are also products. But let's try to stick to technology because even in technology, you know, I'm working with, um, you know, um, let's say developers. There is also a lot of technology wasting, you know, people building product that eventually no one needs. What do you think about that? This is also wasting uh, not only time and money, but also a technology wasted because there are a lot of products out there. So it's also, look, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. it's a good, it's a good question. Sometimes we have some, we look at some products where we think, why should I buy this? What's that for? And then <clears throat> five years later, we have learned it changed our life. So for example, as we had, let's relate today, COVID is triggering an increase in efficiency overall, even though we might not because the old mindset of having a face to face, sitting on a plane, you know, polluting the, you know, there was a flight shaming even before all of that is changing. We just heard before that the, you know, the company raised money during COVID times, all virtually. That's all possible. Absolutely. Now, 
but that means also when you innovate, you know, it's a little bit like like the old sentence from <clears throat> from Henry Ford, where he said, you know, if he would have asked his customer, yeah, what they would need, they would have said a faster horse rather than you know an industrialized car to be manufactured. So there is a visionary angle to it, and also how do you think it's of course in technology the big problem is adoption. And of course, <clears throat> to get an adoption <clears throat> in rich countries is tough because you have to disrupt food, food chains. So you have a Tesla going, taking gazillions to fight against the car industry because Tesla is not a car company. It's a technology company. Yeah, eventually succeeding now, but with a lot of, you know, I mean, it was a, it's a tough fight. Or you might decide you go somewhere else where you can just leapfrog, which is emerging markets. Of course, then here we are talking in Europe to an audience in Asia. This is something where you might sense, you know, you might not look at Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia. You might look at, you know, Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, you know, Philippines for a business because the adoption rate might be faster. And therefore, it's always, I think, the, the old quest is when you design a product and you want to change something, what is it what you want to change? And if you have, if you're something adamant about it, do you really want this because you are, you know, do you want, you have, you want to right a wrong. And if that writing wrong means you're resolving an issue of the world, even better, because in, in, in today's world, probably that's embraced. But I would just want to say that by, by technology, improves the efficiency. And so far, technology has always weighed out any negative effect on workforce, on employment, because the net was always higher and has increased, even the extreme poverty. And now technology at this stage actually provides an opportunity for anyone in the world, you know, it might take some time, to participate in, in the real economy. Because it's virtual, because it's data driven, which is very exciting. Absolutely, absolutely. This is a new era and this is absolutely also exciting time. Um, we have really one minute and I want us to give a really good tip and give and I would say takeaways to our um, listener here. What is your best, I would say, giveaway or tip to, um, to the audience today how to become or to focus more into impact when they are building their own startup? So my recommendation is, if you have a vocation and something you want to do and change in the world, dare to do it as a job. Because then, I mean, it's, any entrepreneur is not a walk in the park and it's very painful. You know, you have to have the stamina to go through and you have to believe and you go through crisis and you go day by day and keep going. But if the greater purpose, it's not about you, but about the trace you do, the difference you make in the world. So therefore, I would not just not go for the low hanging fruits of doing something because it might be good and rewarding and money, but I would rather go for what you really stand for and the changes you want to trigger in the world. Amazing, and let me emphasize that. I would say as an investors, we are putting the money on the people before everything. So be very genuine. And if this is really stick to your values and passion, we can see it immediately. We like, we smell it in a one second. And this is our tip for you today. Thank you so much, Florian. Pleasure as always. Very happy to have you today. And thank you everyone that were here today with us and enjoy the conference. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye, Mali. Bye-bye.